This section of the Bhagavatam is very, very beautiful because here Krishna is being established as the Supreme Personality of Godhead. You may have noticed this interesting terminology when you came to the Hare Krishna movement, the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Uh, before coming to ISKCON, I had never heard of really the Godhead and I've never really heard of the Supreme Personality but Srila Prabhupada, he kept using this terminology again and again in his books that Krishna is the Supreme Personality of Godhead. In fact, when Srila Prabhupada was beginning the movement, someone suggested that rather than calling it the International Society for Krishna Consciousness, maybe you should just call it the International Society for God Consciousness because God is more universal God will be much more acceptable to people in the Western world. Krishna may sound Indian. Krishna may sound to be sectarian. So why not keep it much more open? And Srila Prabhupada said, no, God is a vague concept which can encompass many different things. But Krishna is the supreme personality of Godhead, very specific. One of the main goals of the Bhagavatam is to establish Krishna as the Supreme Person. I'm just going to bring up something on my screen here and do a little bit of writing. Because this first I wanted to clarify with all of you this morning, because this is a huge misconception that people have uh, of Vedic tradition, of Sanatana Dharma, of what we call modern day Hinduism. Um, some people think Sanatana Dharma is a culture of polytheism. In other words, they think that um, those who follow the Vedas believe in many, many gods, that there are multiple gods. Um, this is not actually the case. Now, many other people have come to realize that the Vedic tradition is actually monotheistic, monotheism. We believe in one God. And while that's true, that actually also is not the complete truth. So today I'm going to give you the full name of what those who follow Sanatan Dharma actually believe and how you would label them. You wouldn't label them polytheists. You wouldn't even label them monotheists. What you would actually label them is polymorphic by monotheists. It's a bit of a mouthful and maybe you'll get used to it. But this is actually what Sanatan Dharma is teaching the world. The first thing that uh, the Vedas is teaching the world is that monotheism, there is one God, there is one supreme person, there is one God. However, by monotheism, that God has a male and a female aspect. And therefore, we never worship Krishna alone. We always worship Krishna with Radharani. Uh, the male aspect of divinity is always paired with the female divine. Therefore, in the Chaitanya Charitamrita, you'll find the verse, Radha Krishna Pranaya Vikritir Ladini Shakti Rasmad Ekat Mana Vapi Bhuvi Deha Bedo Gato To that Radha and Krishna Ekat Manav, they were actually originally one, but they eternally separated from each other for the purpose of loving pastimes. So sometimes people say, I don't like uh, these monotheistic religions. They're too patriarch, patriarchal. They just always say God is a man. But actually, we believe God has a male and a female, both aspects. Um, and therefore, technically, more specifically, we are not just monotheists, but we're bi-monotheists. But not just that, we believe in polymorphic bimonotheism because we believe that that male and female aspect of God can take many forms. And therefore, although we understand Krishna and Radharani to be the original, we understand that 
Sita and Ram are also a form of that divine. We also understand that Lakshmi and Narayan are a form of that divine. And therefore, the technical name for what we follow is this. So please try to remember this. Polymorphic by monotheists. This is very, very important because many people in the... Um, when studying Vedic culture or when growing up in the tradition of Vedic culture, they mix things up. There is a supreme God. But then there are many avatars of that God. But then there are also demigods or what we call in Sanskrit devatas. And then there are jivas or living entities, ordinary living entities. Now, what often happens is that people mix these up. So they may take a god to be the supreme god, a demigod to be the supreme god, or sometimes they take a jiva to be the supreme god, or sometimes they think there is no difference between the demigods and the avatars. But these are all distinct character uh, categories, and they cannot be mixed. Either you're a jiva or you're a demigod, uh, of course, jivas can become demigods. That's a slight um, nuance there. But avatars are a separate category, and the Supreme Lord is a separate category. The Supreme Lord and the avatars are known as Vishnu Tattva. And the demigods and the jivas are known as Jiva Tattva. And so, one of the purposes of this chapter in the Bhagavatam is that what is being established is that yes there may be many many avatars but krishna is the source of all incarnations and therefore please remember this verse in maybe a few weeks you will be discussing srimad bhagavatam 1 3 28 this verse begins ete chamsha kalapumsha krishna stu bhagavan svayam now, this is a very, very important line. Krishna stu Bhagavan Svayam. Krishna is the Supreme Personality of Godhead, the source of all incarnations. And this verse is known as the Paribhasa Sutra. Paribhasa Sutra means the emperor verse. So this is the emperor verse of the Srimad Bhagavatam upon which everything is established. So... The first thing that I'm sharing with you is that there is a very, very scientific understanding that Krishna is the Supreme Personality of Godhead. And this is one of the biggest misunderstandings in the world that people don't understand that Krishna is the Supreme Personality of Godhead. They take a demigod to be on the level of God. They take a jiva to be on the level of God. But they, they even may think there's not a difference between avatars and God, but there is. There is one supreme God, and that is Krishna. Now, some of you may be hearing this thinking that's a bit sectarian. That's your view. That's your opinion. But actually, that's not our opinion. That's actually what the Srimad Bhagavatam is establishing. I want to share with you one other major misconception that people have is that they are not always clear what is the relationship between Krishna and Vishnu. If you look in the world today, many people think Krishna is an incarnation of Vishnu. But here in 1328, we're saying Krishna is too, Bhagavan Svayam. Krishna is the source of all incarnations. So which one is true? Is Krishna an incarnation of Vishnu or is Vishnu an incarnation of Krishna? Well, there's truth to both things and I'll explain why. Krishna we can say, is God at home. Vishnu is God at work. So when Krishna wants to establish or create the material worlds, then Krishna expands as Vishnu. And Vishnu then lying on the causal ocean from the pores of his body, all the universes come out. So Krishna, Natasya Karyam, Karanam Chavidyate, Krishna has no work to do. Krishna is just 
having a good time. He's playing the flute, running with the cowherd boys, dancing with the gold peas, stealing butter. Uh, he has no work to do. But when the work of creating the material world comes about, then he expands as Vishnu, and as Vishnu, he does the work. So Vishnu is actually an incarnation of Krishna. Vishnu is known as a Purusha avatar. Then why do so many people think that Krishna is an incarnation of Vishnu? This is the reason. Because from Vishnu comes the material world, isn't it? And when Krishna wants to descend to the material world as an incarnation, then what Krishna does is he appears in the material world through Vishnu. And therefore, people think that Krishna is an incarnation of Vishnu because when Krishna descends to the world, he appears through Vishnu. But that doesn't mean Vishnu is his source. He simply appears through the gateway of Vishnu. Just like some of you appeared in the temple room through the door of the temple room. That doesn't mean the door gave birth to you. It just means the door was the gateway through which you came here. So in the same way, when Krishna wants to enter the material world, then Krishna enters through the gateway of Vishnu. And that's why some people mistake Krishna to be an incarnation of Vishnu. Krishna is actually the source. Sarva Karana Karanam. Lord Brahma says in the Brahma Samhita, Ishvara Parama Krishna Sachit Ananda Vigraha Anadira Dirgovinda Sarva Karana Karanam. So Krishna is the source of all incarnations. He's the supreme cause of all causes. So today, as we begin our discussion, because today's verse is all about Krishna and Balaram, I'm just sharing with you that Krishna is indeed the source of all incarnations. He's not just another avatar. No, he is avatari. He's the source of all avatars. Then why, you may say, does Krishna come in different avatars? Because every avatar of Krishna has a purpose. Every avatar of Krishna takes on a different form because every avatar has a different mission according to what's going on in cosmic history. So when Krishna wants to assume the form of an avatar that rescues the earth planet from the nether regions, then Krishna takes the form of a boar known as Varahadev, because that's the most suitable form for to then go into the causal ocean and bring the universe back out. When Krishna wants to uh, ex uh, exhibit his extreme anger because of uh, the mistreatment of his devotee, then naturally Krishna takes the form of a lion, because what can be more fierce than a lion? And therefore the Lord appears as Nishingadev. Therefore, there are many avatars, and according to the time, the place, the circumstance, and the purpose of that avatar, they all assume a different um, form. Although they assume a different form, every avatar basically does universal things. The first thing that every avatar appears for is the protection. Protection of who? The demigods. For example, the demigods are often in danger because they're in a fight with the demons. And then when they find no other recourse, then they go to the milk ocean and beseech the Lord to come. And then the Lord incarnates to save them. So one reason for the avatar is the protection of the demigods. Another reason for avatars is for the correction of the demons. So not only does the Lord come to uh, protect the demigods, but he also comes to correct the demons. But not just that, there's another reason why the Lord appears, and that is because of affection for his devotees. Because he has affection, the devotees are always longing to see the Lord. The devotees are always longing to be in contact with the Lord. 
And therefore, when the Lord appears in different avatars, then he has these beautiful uh, relationships and interactions with uh, his devotees. So he appears for the affection for the devotees. And then it's said that the Lord also appears in order to create an attraction amongst the conditioned souls. In other words, the Lord comes to attract the conditioned souls by coming to the world and performing different pastimes, which then uh, draw the attention of the souls in this world and uh, cause them to become attracted to the Supreme Person. So can you now begin to see why there are so many different avatars appearing in so many forms? And every avatar, although having their unique personality, every avatar is basically performing these universal uh, tasks. Protection of the demigods, correction of the demons, affection for these, and attraction of the conditioned souls. Outside of all of this, these can be said to be external reasons why the Lord comes. And aside from all of these, the Lord has an internal reason why he comes to the world, which is to um, enjoy pastimes of love. So we can say the other reason why the Lord comes is just for recreation. And therefore, uh, Krishna also comes just to experience uh, uh, beautiful pastimes in which he also just has a good time. And so Srimad Bhagavatam is telling us about all of these avatars. Actually, in Srimad Bhagavatam, there are 10 subjects, 10 different things that the Srimad Bhagavatam talks about. The first thing, Atra Sarga, the first thing the Bhagavatam talks about is creation. The second thing the Bhagavatam talks about, Visarga, Brahma's creation or secondary creation. Atra Sarga, Visarga, Scha, Stanam. The third thing the Bhagavatam talks about, Stanam, which means planetary systems. The fourth thing, Poshanam. Poshanam means protection, how the Lord protects the devotees. Stanam Poshanam. Utaya. The next thing the Bhagavatam talks about is Uti, or the creative impetus. Then the next thing, Manvantarain Shanukata, Manvantara. The Bhagavatam talks about all the different Manus. Manus are fathers of mankind. And what did those uh, Manus do um, in their time on this earth? Next topic, Ishanukata, which is relevant for us today. It basically means activities of the avatars so bhagavatam talks about many different activities of the avatars nirodha this is the uh, eighth topic which means annihilation how does everything come to an end mukti this is the ninth topic how do we become liberated from this world shelter so these are the 10 topics of the Srimad Bhagavatam and therefore you'll find today we're reading uh, text number uh, chapter number 3 and it's very much focused around this topic Ishanukata uh, what is the activities of different avatars yeah this is very very uh, interesting the Bhagavatam is actually like a mandala. It's like this. It's actually like a spiral. So what happens in the Bhagavatam 
is that the same topic is talked about again and again and again in different ways so that ultimately you then reach the ultimate conclusion and essence of it. So what happens in the Bhagavatam, for example, in Canto 1, chapter number 3, which is the chapter we're reading now, you hear about the incarnations. But then what happens is in Canto number 2, chapter number 7, you hear about all the incarnations again. But then what happens is between Canto number 3 and 9, you hear about those same incarnations, but in more detail, the stories are given. And then ultimately, that's meant to lead you to Canto number 10, because Canto number 10 is the Canto which is all about Krishna, and Krishna is the essence of everything, the Ashraya and the Supreme Shelter. And that's why all of these incarnations are described just to bring more and more attention to Krishna, because Krishna is ultimately the Supreme Personality of Godhead. So these are some different things which are um, kind of described. I'll just say a few more things because I've given you a lot of information so far, and I'm going to give you a little bit more information, and then I'm going to open it up to see what questions. So please think of what questions you have. One of our teachers, Bhaktivinoda Thakur, he says that there are different grades of knowledge. He says there is confidential knowledge. He says there is more confidential knowledge. And then he says there is the most confidential knowledge. Now, see if you can guess what the most confidential knowledge is. I'll tell you the other two. He says confidential knowledge is knowledge about Krishna's avatars. That's quite confidential. Not everyone knows about that. But he says more confidential than that is knowledge of Krishna. Now, my question to you is, if knowledge of Krishna is more confidential, what's the most confidential? Can there be anything more confidential than knowledge of Krishna? What can be most confidential? Anyone have a, want to have a guess? If anyone in the temple room has a guess, then Purushottam Prabhu can say on the... Uh... Anyone uh, want to have a guess? Someone said Radharani. Radharani, okay, that was a good guess. But Krishna and Radharani, actually, these come together. Yeah, Krishna and Radharani. <laughs> but it's close. Your answer is actually close. Service of Krishna. Uh, we have some answers in the chat. Um, okay. Service of Krishna. Service Knowledge of Krishna, of good guess. Not quite. Why? Rasalila, uh, that, how to get to Krishna? No. Yeah. That Krishna is supreme. That Krishna is supreme. That is more, more confidential knowledge. Knowledge that Krishna is supreme, that Radharani is his eternal consort, that Bhakti is the way to reach him. But there's something more, most confidential. Clearly, it's most confidential because not everyone knows. <laughs> I'm uh, sure Krishna's someone knows. No. I'm sure someone must know. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu? Yes, thank you very much. Yes, Bhaktivinoda Thakur says, actually, knowledge of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is the most confidential because Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is actually the combined form of Radha and Krishna who has actually come in Kali Yuga in order to deliver um, the opportunity to actually uh, connect deeply with Radha and Krishna in a relationship of love. And that's why Bhaktivinoda Thakur is making this point that even many of those who come from the Vedic tradition, they, even they don't know about Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. 
Even those that know about Chaitanya Mahaprabhu think Chaitanya Mahaprabhu to be a God conscious saint, but they don't understand that Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is actually Krishna who has come down to the material world in the Kali Yuga in order to deliver the opportunity to go back to Vrindavan and to go back to Krishna. And so uh, Bhaktivinoda Thakur says, uh, definitely we should know about the avatars. Um, on top of that, we should know about Krishna, who is the source of all avatars. But on top of that, we should know about Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, because Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is Krishna who has come to the world in this age to actually deliver um, the Yuga Dharma or the process for this age. And therefore, the famous poet Naratam Das Thakur, he sings, Rajendra Nandana say, Sachitu Suta Holo Hoilo say, Balaram Hoilo Nitai. That Rajendra Nandan Krishna, he is the same as Sachi Suta, the son of Sachi, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, Balaram Hoilo Nitai, and Balaram came to this world in Kali Yuga as Nityananda. And many, many people don't know that. Shri Krishna Chaitanya Nityananda Sahodito Gaudadaya Pushpavanto Chitro Shando Tamo Nudo. Chaitanya Charitamrita says that Chaitanya and Nityananda are like the sun and the moon, and they have arisen on the horizon of Goda just to dissipate the darkness that has enveloped the world in Kali Yuga. So let me just summarize what we talked about today. Today we talked about how we are not polytheists or monotheists, but rather we are polymorphic by monotheists. I explained what that terminology is. And then we just talked a little bit about how people often mix up the Supreme Lord, the avatars, the demigods and the jivas, but they are distinct categories. And then I told you about the Paribhasa Sutra of the Bhagavatam 1.3.28 which establishes Krishna's do Bhagavan Swayam. When Krishna, uh, people have a misunderstanding about Krishna and Vishnu, they think that Krishna is an incarnation of Vishnu. By explaining to you how Krishna is actually the source of Vishnu and simply appears through the agency of Vishnu when coming into the material world. And then we talked about different avatars and why they come to the world. Um, they have certain external purposes and they have an internal purpose. And then we talked about the 10 topics of the Bhagavatam and that the activities of the avatars are something that are talked about again and again in the Bhagavatam. And ultimately, all of those talks of the avatars are meant to bring us to the point of understanding that Krishna is the supreme personality of Godhead. But not just that, Bhaktivinoda Thakur says beyond that confidential, more confidential knowledge that Krishna is the supreme person, we should also understand that Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, who has come in Kali Yuga, is Krishna, is the supreme person who has come to deliver the um, process of Nam Sankirtan or chanting the holy names, which is the process for this age. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Shri Prabhupada Ki Jai. So thank you for patiently listening. I know it's not always easy to listen on Zoom. I hope that that was giving you some uh, food for thought. And I'm happy to take uh, any questions. Uh, should anyone have any questions or if there's anything else you would like to know more about, perhaps you have some clarifications. Um, then we can also uh, have a little bit of a discussion. Do you want to come here? And say? Okay. All right. Someone's coming on. Okay, sure. Yes, please come. Hare Krishna Prabhu. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Uh, Prabhu, uh, I don't have a specific question right now, but I wanted to just share my gratitude because um, uh, I actually watched your video in uh, the one in which you shared your thoughts with the uni students, the UCL students. Yes. Yeah. 
Uh, that oh, time uh, I had a, uh, yeah, uh, that time I had a tough semester. I was just feeling low. Um, and this video just randomly appeared uh, um, on suggested videos for me. I just watched and it, uh, it really gave me the relief, uh, made me feel more motivated. So just wanted to say thank you so much. Thank you so much. Yes, I hope you did well in your, uh, or you continue to do well in your exams. And yeah, remember that whatever you're doing in life, it can be a devotional service to Krishna. So being a student is a service to Krishna. Uh, working in the world and doing your career is a service to Krishna as long as you connect everything. So yeah, be the best you can and uh, offer it to Krishna. And in that way, it will become uh, uh, glorious on all levels. Hare Krishna. Thank you. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Hare Krishna, yes. Yes, how are you? I'm very good. You have a question? Yes, Maharaj. Um, you know, once one uh, Mataji, she told me about like before Krishna appeared uh, in Gokul, um, uh, before he went, he went to the village, you know, all the villages there, they were living in peace, you know. But after Krishna went to Gokul, then all the demons started coming and causing disturbance in the villagers' lives. So the Mataji, what she was trying to tell me is that that is how it is in devotees' lives, that, you know, when Krishna, when when we come to Krishna consciousness, then a lot of problems come. So are they like test, or you know, um, I don't know if you understand what I'm yeah, trying to ask. Yeah, I understand your question. Yeah, thank you, thank you so much. Yeah, it's a good advertisement on the Sunday feast. Become Krishna conscious, and uh, all the problems will come in your life. All the demons will start coming. <laughs> uh maybe it might scare a few people away you know basically it's like this in our life krishna is not just facilitating you to have a peaceful life mm. krishna is facilitating you to have a life in which you will become purified and you'll actually be able to experience the highest type of spiritual happiness so sometimes when krishna enters your life then there will be ups and downs, there will be difficulties, there will be obstacles. And sometimes mm. you may think, uh, before I started this Krishna consciousness, everything was fine. And now there are so many challenges. Sometimes it may be like that. But we understand that those challenges, those difficulties, those obstacles come to make us stronger, to make us more realized in the philosophy of Krishna consciousness, and ultimately mm. to bring us closer to Krishna. So the goal of life is not to live comfortably in the material world because mm. you can't live comfortably in the material world even if everything's perfect and everyone will ultimately die. That's the reality. Janma mrityu jaravyadi dukha doshan udarshanam. So Krishna mm. says, I don't want you to be comfortable in this material world because there is no comfort in the material world. Everything mm. in the material world is doomed for failure. So rather Krishna, he creates a situation which helps us to become awake to a higher reality. And that awakeness to the higher reality is what ultimately gets us out of this world and into real peace. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you for your question. Yeah, sorry. Uh, just one yes. more question I have. Garima, I'm just going to go to others and then we'll come back to you if there's time, just so everyone gets a chance. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, so, it's, okay. It's, there's a few hands, but uh, there was one question that came uh, earlier. How should we prioritize our spiritual activities? Because sometimes, you know, we have house programs, we have Bhagavatam class, Sunday feast. Are you now I'm going on in summer. Um, 
and it's sometimes difficult to do everything all the time. So how should we how should we prioritize them? So one thing is always have a morning sadhana time that never gets compromised, no matter what. Between five and six, between uh, five and seven, however much time you can set aside, that should be done every day. That time is off limits. That time should never be hijacked by anything else. If you first begin with that strictness of doing your daily sadhana, some chanting, some reading in the morning every single day, then that will make you uh, steady and strong. And then outside of that, yes, there are unlimited services, unlimited programs. So choose those which are inspiring to you. Choose those which are giving you an opportunity to serve. And then ensure that your other duties in life are being balanced as well. And uh, sometimes you have to adjust and pull away from things. But the main message I want to give you today is that try to have a time early in the morning that you do every single day. Anyone who achieved any kind of tangible progress in Krishna consciousness, it was because they were strict in having a daily sadhana in the morning. Please, please, please prioritize this. When the alarm goes off in the morning, it's like the call of death for some people. It's like the hardest thing in life. Uh, so please, please resist the temptation to keep hitting the snooze button. Uh, please be disciplined and learn to develop a great love for the morning hours. Uh, rise always before the sun and spend that time every day and you'll find that everything else in your life will get balanced because of that early morning practice yeah uh thank you Maharaj. so we have a couple of hands monica mataji if you want to go ahead um, Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. oh monica's in the room is it Maybe she has to come to the front. Yeah, she is. Yeah. Hi, Krishna Prabhu. Thank you so much Hi. for um, speaking with us today. It's so inspiring. Um, I was just uh, speaking with uh, like a colleague. I just work at a, a fitness center and we were just talking about Nashima Chatudasi and and uh, we were just talking about religion a little bit and she was talking about how like in Catholicism she was really um, just turned off by how much shame is sort of the motivating factor um, and I just thought I don't really feel a lot of shame but that's my personality I think but uh, I think can you speak a little bit about this topic and and how you know it could be maybe healthy or maybe unhealthy. Just just a small tidbit that would be wonderful, and maybe a, how we Thank could you. use it as a, a preaching tool to speak about. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Monica. Nice point. Well, Bhaktivinoda Thakur he says that religion is often practiced on four levels. He says the lowest level of religion is practiced bhaya, out of fear, guilt, and shame. He says this is actually the lowest type of religion. He says higher than that is when you practice religion, asha, out of material desire. You want something from God. You, you want to you know, achieve something. So you go, go to the temple, make a prayer. That's a little higher. He says higher than that, kartavya, when you practice religion out of a sense of duty. No, God has already done so many things for me. I should do something for God. But he says higher than that is when you practice religion, prema, out of love, prema dharma, the religion of love. You're coming to Krishna not because you want something, not because you're duty bound, not because you feel bad or you're scared, but because you actually have some attraction towards him. So therefore in Krishna consciousness, guilt and shame is not actually the way in which we generally inspire people to go forward. We inspire people to go forward on the basis of how spirituality can enrich 
and enliven their lives and inspire their lives in so many ways by having a relationship with the most amazing person, Krishna. However, yes, some element of guilt and shame and feeling that I'm falling short of the ideal, I should do better. Some element of that can be useful, you know, when we look at ourselves and we think, I should be better, I should do better, I can do better, then that guilt and shame can act as an impetus for us to uh, improve in our life. However, if the guilt and shame become so strong that you become hopeless and depressed and demoralized, then it starts becoming counterproductive. So some topic of guilt and shame um, is is you know is is useful, um, but in a in a in a measurement, really we're trying to inspire people to practice this out of uh, love. We don't want someone to come to the temple and tell them if you don't chant every single day, then something terrible may happen in your life. Like that's not how we inspire people. We say if you chant, then the most beautiful things in your life will happen. Here's some beads, give it a try. Um, that's a much more beautiful way to connect with Krishna. Yeah, I hope that's okay. Thank you for your question. Thank you. Thank you, Maharaj. Uh, Anand Madhav Prabhu, if you want to go ahead. Yeah, thank you, Prisha Prabhu. Hare Krishna Maharaj. So hey, just Anand Madhav, nice to see you. <laughs> this is here as well. So one question I had is when you were explaining the breakdown between Supreme God, Avatars, Demigods, and Jivas, one challenge I necessarily have is explaining the place of the holy name, the Lord's paraphernalia, and how does that fit into that? And even if we say that, no, they're just as good as a Supreme Lord, sometimes there's this um, perception that we are still erring on the side of impersonalism. How can name be the same as something that's personal. And I've always had a challenge trying to explain that. So I was wondering if you could help us out there. Yeah. Well, the name of Krishna is described in the Puranas. Nama Chintamani Krishna's Chaitanya Rasa Vigraha Purna Shuddha Nitya Mukta Bhinatvan Nama Namino Nama Chintamani Krishna's, Krishna's name is like a touchstone. Uh, rasa Vigraha is full of all rasa, all relish. Uh, and then the final line says, Bhinnatvan Nama Namino. There's no difference. Nama, the name, Namino, the one who is indicated by the name, Abhinna, there's no, there's no difference. It's, they're completely uh, non different. They're the same. So we understand that when we say Krishna, that is Krishna. Krishna is there. That is, uh, that is the difference between a material sound and a spiritual sound. Yet in a higher dimensional sense, there is a difference between, because when you call Krishna, Krishna may come. And if Krishna comes, then, then that's a different experience. So are Krishna's names and Krishna the same or are they different? Uh, well, they're simultaneously the same and different. This is known as the philosophy of Achintya, Veda, Abheda, Tattva. And that counts for many things. Krishna and his creation, are they the same or are they different? We can say simultaneously, Krishna is the same and different. Is Krishna and the avatars the same or different? The same and also different. And is Krishna and his name the same or different? The same and different. Because there is always, so this is the spiritual um, dimension, uh, cannot be contained or boxed and saying it's this or this, but rather it's this and this. And both things are true, um, even though it sounds like a contradiction, uh, it's not a contradiction, because they're both true from their own perspective. Like that. Thank you so much, Maharaj. Thank you. Uh, uh, just had a couple more questions, Maharaj, if that's okay. Sure, sure. So we had one that in the Krishna book, there is a breakdown of all the different avatars. For example, Sankarshan mm -hmm. and such. 
Can you clarify whether those are also expansions of Vishnu or Krishna? So this gets a little technical, but basically there's Krishna and then Krishna's first expansion is Balaram. And from Balaram comes the first Chatur Vyuha. So Aniruddha, Shankarshan, Pradyumna, and um, Vasudev. And from that Chatur Vyuha comes Narayan. And from that Narayan comes the second Chatur Vyuha. And from that Chatur Vyuha comes Mahavishnu, from whom all the uh, universes are emanating. So it's somewhat technical. But basically, we can say that the um, Shankarshan, Pradyumna, Aniruddha, these are the forms of the Lord situated in Vaikuntha. And from them, uh, Shira, uh, Karana Dakshai Vishnu or Mahavishnu comes, who is basically the creator of the material universes. And then from Mahavishnu comes Garba Dakshai Vishnu, who enters into each universe. And then from Garba Dakshai Vishnu comes Shira Dakshai Vishnu, who enters into every single atom. And like this, the expansions are perpetuating like that. Um, then one, one last question. Uh, so we see like in, in different, uh, different Puranas and different scriptures, that sometimes some of the demigods are also called as, as God or the, the, the Supreme Personality. Bhagavan. So, yeah. So how do we answer that or how do we understand the difference? Yeah, for example, in Shastra, you will even find, for example, sometimes Narad Muni is referred to as Bhagavan. But Bhagavan, etym etymologically, Bhagavan just means, Bhaga means opulence or Bhaga means op opulence. And Van means the possessor. So anyone who has some opulence, they are Bhagavan. They have some opulence. Like if you have a good car, you are Bhagavan to some extent because you have some okay. opulence. But you are not um, Purna Purushottam Bhagavan. You're not the supreme person who's perfect in all respects and, and holds all opulences. So therefore in Shastra, yes, many may be referred to as Bhagavan. So Bhagavan can be a general term referring to uh, anyone who has opulence and Bhagavan can also sometimes refer to the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Therefore, it's very important when you're reading Sanskrit to always understand the context within which a word is being used. For example, the word Atma can refer to soul. But did you know the word Atma can also refer to the mind? And Atma can also refer to the body as well. In Shastra, you'll find all three usages. And therefore, unless you have a help of a teacher and someone who knows the context of every Shastra, you may misinterpret a word and use it and understand it in its wrong context. Therefore, uh, we always have to understand uh, spiritual knowledge with the help of others. Otherwise, we can become confused. Yeah. Uh, I'm not sure, Maharaj, do you have time to take a couple more or? We, uh, we yeah, time? I have five minutes. Five minutes. I have to, in 10 minutes, I have to go to another program, but I have, I can do five minutes. There is a question in the chat. Uh, so what is the scientific explanation of Krishna, that he is the source? And Krishna being the source, then why Krishna appeared as Krishna as one of the avatars? Uh, so I don't quite understand the second question. Let me answer the first question. What's the scientific uh, proof for Krishna being the source? Well... Science can't prove Krishna because science is limited. Science relies on the senses. Science re relies on the mind. And the mind and the senses are inherently limited. 
what to speak of proving Krishna, science can't even prove the Big Bang, or science can't even prove evolution. Uh, science can maybe give some conjecture, but science by definition is limited because it's based on limited paraphernalia of perception. And so when we want to understand who is the Supreme Person, Dasmad Shastram Pramanam Te, the Praman, the evidence, is not scientific research, because scientific research is within the realms of matter. If you want to understand the evidence for who's supreme, then you have to go to the spiritual source. And what's the spiritual source of evidence? Tasmat Shastra, scripture. And therefore, if you want to understand why and how Krishna is the supreme person, then you have to go to scripture. And then you may say, but there are so many scriptures saying so many different things. And then I would have to go into an explanation given by Jiva Goswami in the Tattva Sandarbha, in which he establishes that the Srimad Bhagavatam is the essence of all the Vedas. Sarve Vedanta Sadam hi Srimad Bhagavatam Ishade. So even though the Vedas may say so many things about who God is, the ultimate conclusion of who God is, is found Srimad Bhagavatam, in the Bhagavatam, because that's the Sarva Vedanta Sar, that's the, that's the essence of the Vedas. And the Bhagavatam says very clearly, Krishna's do Bhagavan Swayam, that Krishna is the Supreme Person. So this is like, people think, oh yeah, you would say that, you are the Hare Krishnas, of course you're going to say Krishna's God, I mean, that's who you got, no, but it's the other way around. We've read the Shastra, the Shastra tells us where Krishna is the Supreme, therefore we're the Krishna Consciousness Movement, it's not the other way around. If someone wants to prove that A, B, or C, or D is the Supreme Person, we have no problem. Show us, Dasmad Shastra Pramanam Te, show us where in Shastra that is said. And then we will have a discussion on that. So it's not just that this person is God because my grandmother's grandmother's father's sister-in-law who lived in a nice village in India where there was a really good temple, um, they told me. So obviously, obviously, no, no, that, that is not evidence. Evidence must come from Shastra. So that is the scientific proof. Thank you so much, Mahaprabhu, for sparing the time. I believe I'm taking so much time from you. Um, but I have this question that uh, these days I've been feeling like uh, people around me, uh, especially my family and my close relatives, are having. Um, more expectations as they used to. Uh, I just feel like as I go forward with uh, achieving those uh, expectations, they just keep on increasing and uh, there's no way I'm getting close to it. Um, and uh, that results in disappointment sometimes on their part. Uh, I just wanted to uh, ask if there is any way that we can keep on practicing religion, update in that, and we can keep uh, uh, working up to expectations of people around us. Yeah, thank you so much. So many expectations of people around you. How do you make everyone happy? Well, let me tell you, there's one formula in life. If you try to make everyone happy, you'll make no one happy and you'll probably end up miserable as well. It's just not possible because too many people, too many expectations. Okay, let me say a few things here. First thing is expectations are not a bad thing. When someone has expectations of you, it can help you to achieve more. It can push you further. So expectations are not a bad thing. However, whose expectations do you take seriously? There may be 20, 30, 40 people around you and they all have an opinion of what you should do and who you should be. So whose expectations do you take seriously? You take the expectations of a person who knows you, a person who loves you, and a person who has the spiritual knowledge to be able to help you. 
If you find someone in your life who has these three qualities, in Sanskrit we say sajatiya, they know you. Snehasya, they love you. Ashraya, they're advanced enough to help you. If someone has these three qualities, then their expectations stand for more. So out of 30 people who have expectations, you can respect all of them, but you don't carry all of their expectations on the same level. Rather, you find one or two people who know you, who love you, and who can actually help you because they don't just have material expertise, they have spiritual knowledge. And then you try to live up to their expectations because their expectations can carry you to your potential. So everyone has an opinion. So if you try to um, live up to everyone's opinion, it will be very disconcerting. But rather try to find the opinion and expectations of these individuals, one or two people like this, and let them encourage you and uh, lovingly push you so you can achieve more in your life.